Welcome everyone to the Tuesday evening talk. This event is hosted by the Anabuti Meditation and Retreat Center, which is administered by the Brahma Kumaris. Sister Vinu, um, I will say a little bit about, I've known her for some time now. She is a resident teacher at our Los Angeles Center, where she's giving the class right now from Los Angeles. And um, she has actually been raised in this wonderful organization of the Brahma Kumaris since she was practically born in the laps of the Dadis, um, nurtured and um, sustained by the family, the godly family and such a, a lovely uh, environment and she took the best advantage of that. She's really gleaned uh, from her company of the seniors and wonderful teachers in her life. And she's just um, a wonderful energy, as you will know, uh, listening to her, um, just filled with authenticity and um, genuine love from the heart for everyone. So welcome again, Sister Vinu. Shanti. Wow, that's a very big label <laughs> you've um, given me. I'll try to live up to it. <laughs> um, the picture of the light, um, the supreme light on the screen. And I'll walk you through with some commentary, some food for the thought. And you can try to you know, mentally follow whatever that I will be sharing. And, um, and I would invite you to have an open eye meditation with me so you can focus your eyes um, on the light, which will be quite practical uh, considering meditation is a everyday, every moment practice. So I'm gonna put the picture of the light and then after the meditation, we will go from there. So just for a few moments. Keep your body relaxed. And whatever, if you have any sound around you or if you're holding anything physically, you can put it all aside. And now bring your focus to within you. And for a few moments, we're gonna go back to our childhood days. We're gonna rewind back our life. And now visualize those people, the souls who were present when you were a child, maybe your parents, or your guardians, or your siblings. Just visualize them in front of you right now. And as you look at them, each one of them, A lot of memories connected with them would come in your mind. And ask yourself this question, what did you learn from them? During your interaction and living with them what did they teach you? And now let's move a little forward to your school days. You see your colleagues 
your classmates, your teachers. What did they teach you? Some memories could be a little sweet. Some memories may not have been that sweet, but still, what did you learn from them? Now let's move a little more forward. When you finished your school, when you started a new job, or when you started a new life with a new family, you met new people colleagues, superiors, or in-laws. What did you learn from them? And if you have moved to a different city or to a different country. New environment, new culture, new adaptation. What did that feel like? Was it easy to adapt? or did it take some time? And what did that journey teach you? And looking at your present time, who you are at this present time, you have a treasure store of memories, experiences, and wisdom that you have acquired throughout your journey. What did that feel like? Being who you are right now. And looking back, everything that you have learned from your past. When you were facing those situations at that time, you could have felt it was a challenge. You could have felt it was impossible to succeed, but you made it anyways. You faced it and you succeeded and you learned. Do you appreciate who you are right now? Do you appreciate everything that has happened in your life have molded you to be who you are right now?
Therefore, I can truly believe that I do have the ability to face anything that comes into my life. Even though sometimes it may feel tough in the beginning, but I know I will succeed because I have succeeded many times in my past. And I truly accept and love myself just the way I am. Om Shanti. Om Shanti. So this, um, you know, coming back to the meditation that you just had, um, how many of you were able to experience it? If anyone can share, what did you experience during the meditation? You're most welcome to share your thoughts. Can would you like to share? You can unmute yourself. So this is not a talk, by the way. This is just a family gathering, family sharing their feelings. So um, I'm not a teacher. I really wouldn't consider myself as a teacher. Um, each time when I meet the family in Zoom, I, I feel, you know, we are just together and we're just sharing our what we have learned and what we have known and what we've experienced. And a lot of you there in the Zoom, I'm sure a lot of you have a lot of wisdom as well. So if you could just have the compassionate side to share so we all can learn from each other. Is there any experiences that you had from the meditation? So Perla or anyone can, is most welcome just to uh, give a little experience that you've had. Anjana? Hi, Om Shanti. Om Shanti. I think going back to the childhood, I felt so much love from my, you know, I grew up in, a, uh, in India, like with the uncle, aunt. So I have like three sets of parents and my cousins were like all my sisters and I just felt so much love from each and every one of them and it was just like wonderful wonderful feeling so thank you Om Shanti Hi I like to share Sarla from LA um, I too felt the same thing when you said to go back to the childhood because I don't have my dad, he passed away. So I felt my dad was with me, my uncle, as she said, uncle and aunt. And then I was thinking about what they were teaching me. All that thing came and it was really, I felt I was, what to say, I went back and came back here. It was really good. I got there. Thank you. Any last person would like to share? Um, Shobna from Los Angeles, Sister Om Shanti. And it was a very beautiful experience going back to the childhood. My mother, I lost her when I was a teenager. So I felt that I was around my mom I was swinging in the swing and my dad, my father, also my father loves me so much. And I felt that intense unconditional love of my parents. They are not in it there anymore. And also my grandparents, which was a joint family system. So I had my grandparents, my uncle, my auntie, and my uh, cousins. We were all used to play together. So that feeling was so beautiful, which I would have never gone back to that stage unless it was 
your uh, commentary from the meditation. It was beautiful. And then the school days, the teacher, which I have for long forgotten. So when you said, remember your teacher. So those things are very, very long lost, but it came back to me like an intense feeling. Beautiful. Thank you, sister. So it's, um, and I'm sure all of you enjoyed um, that feeling of just that joy or that love. And definitely there must be some moments where you could have struggled in your past. But now when you look back, you felt like it was worth it. Uh, you, you learned, you grew, um, you became more mature and experienced from those situations. So this feeling of the sense of deep appreciation, the sense of acceptance, um, it's such a beautiful place to be. Uh, it's a beautiful place in the heart. Um, it's a beautiful feeling to be. And it allows us to really accept our life the way it was. And knowing that even moving forward, there could be some similar challenges, situations that you may face. But yet you know that if in the past you succeeded, then in the future you will as well. So might as well we enjoy the journey rather than thinking too much about what's going to happen. So really this feeling that you just had, do you wish to have more of this feeling throughout the day, throughout your life? Do you? Yes. Definitely. Yeah. So during the meditation, when you were able to visualize and experience this feeling of just that lightness, how were you able to experience this lightness? What enabled you to experience this lightness? Is it a sense of detachment? When you are able to see your life on the screen and you just see all these flashbacks and you're just sitting and observing and you're observing what is it that you learned rather than going into the minute details of situations. But you looked at the overall picture and you felt, this is what I learned. This is what I felt. And this is how that experience has helped me to grow. So this sense of detachment or the sense of looking at the overall picture rather than going into these tiny details, that helped you. That helped you to enjoy your memories. Um, that helped you to um, bypass any bitterness that you would have experienced but none of that felt great. None of that felt a big deal right now because there's so much more that you were able to appreciate. Um, and that's why that meaningless, or I wouldn't say meaningless, but whatever you've gone through in terms of challenges, it doesn't seem a big deal. So really this is the, the, the practice or the feelings that we would like to continue having um, in our life, in the present, in the future, even whilst facing situations, challenges, how can I continue having the feeling or the attitude of, okay, what is this teaching me? What is it I'm supposed to learn? So true love, you know, when sister was saying about true heart, heart comes with experience, heart has all the feelings. But the heart for the soul is the mind. Mind is really where we feel. Um, intellect is where we learn, we analyze. The mind is where we feel. And so over a period of time, um, you know, in connection with the Supreme, uh, you may call it as God, or if um, 
Well, I'm not sure how many of you um, have faith or you believe in, in a supreme soul. Um, we always say that if you don't believe in G-O-D, then I'm sure you can believe in G-O-O-D. Both are same energy anyways. <laughs> Whether it's an energy of God or it's the energy of good, uh, we are in the same page, same frequency. So we do need um, to connect with this energy in order to rekindle um, our goodness. And again, love cannot be forced, but love can only come when there is relationship. So how many of you feel that trust comes first or relationship comes first? I think relationship first, then trust. I, okay. I don't know, maybe. Okay, how about the others? It's like a vicious cycle. If you have a good relationship, then you build up a trust. If you have a trust, the relationship can go, uh, grow stronger. So okay. I don't know which one starts first, but it's a... Okay. It's like a chicken or the hen story? Yes. <laughs> okay. Someone else was sharing? I yes, think the trust comes first. Trust comes first, okay. We heard, a, okay, we heard a brother's voice. Um, it, used to be, it used to be relationship first and trust comes up there, but now, of course, it's trust first. <laughs> okay. So, I, I think it's relationship and that bonding, getting to know. Um, each other, you know, with God, getting to know God, you know, getting to know who I am. Uh, okay. Definitely. Okay. Yeah. So, Ashwini, I think also yes. wanted to say something. Uh, sister, trust only comes first. Trust helps us to build a good relationship. Okay. Um, again, I think um, everything is cyclic, right? trust, relationship, and then relationship trust. So let's look at one simple picture. Um, when you see a stranger, um, it may not be sometimes easy to trust a stranger, right? Um, for me to get to know them first, for me to understand them first. And then once I feel a little comfortable then I can share, you know, have a more deeper sharing with them. So first is getting to know, getting to understand. And then from that experience of being in their company, then I can check, okay, I can really trust the soul or I feel I still need a little more time um, to be able to, it's a good soul, but I'm not sure if I'm able to share my intimate feelings with them. So it's basically, you know, getting to know and then that getting to know that experience will then motivate me. Can I then fully surrender? Can I, you know, um, have a much more uh, um, close sharing with that soul in terms of trust? So in this context, if we really see that first uh, the relationship that we learn here is the relationship with my core self, with myself. And how good is my relationship with me? That will really reflect how good my relationship will be with others, even with God. And so do I have a close relationship with myself? Have I really understood myself? And have I really accepted myself? Then the second aspect of trust will become very easy. And if we see that, you know, living in a very social conditioning, um, it's very easy to think on right or wrong aspect. This is right, this is wrong. We probably grew up 
listening to this right or wrong aspect from parents, from teachers, um, school teachers, from society. And we grew up thinking with that mentality, right, wrong. And we, we don't really feel like there is a, you know, it's a, it's a middle, right? It could be neither right, could be neither wrong. It is what it is. And so when we start thinking in a very um, closed mindset, then what happens is we will also try to apply our thinking pattern on others. And when I feel that what I'm thinking is right, is same as what you are thinking, then I feel that like my relationship with you can be closer. But if I feel we have difference of opinions, then I feel my relationship with you could be um, from a distance. And so when a relationship itself has, um, doesn't have a strong foundation, trust is far-fetched, right? It's a different story. So here, you know, again, I'm gonna use the, your meditation that you experienced when you went back to your memories it's like you have re-awakened um, those relationships that you have built with these souls. Maybe these souls could still be alive or maybe these souls may have gone to their next birth. But then the relationship that you've had with them, those memories, those interactions made you feel good made you to realize your worth, your value. Because sometimes we may not understand our worth or value on our own because we have just so much drama, um, internal oppositions that's happening in our mind. And so sometimes we could be depending on someone else's ideas about me in order for me to know more about myself. But someone else's ideas are only to a certain extent because even they are imposing their mindset on what they think about me, which can be true, but for the most part, it is probably their way of thinking about me. And so now here in this meditation, Raj Yoga meditation, I'm learning how to rethink about myself. I am learning to break the whole understanding of right and wrong that I've lived with for many births, for, for a lifelong, breaking this barrier of right and wrong and coming to terms that difference may not be a bad thing. Difference can be unique as well. And for me to check, okay, what works for me? What is helping me to grow? And so how will I know what works for me and what helps me to grow is you check your heart, your vibrations, because we have used our head too much, just a little too much. And you know the head has become hot and the heart has become cold. But now we have to reverse it. Let the head be cool and the heart be warm. So in order for me to understand what is in my heart, I have one is silence helps because in silence you are not deliberately um, distracting yourself, your attention, your focus on someone else or on something else. You are just you in your world, in your mind and understanding yourself. And two, you allow God to reach out to you. You open your heart to God and God knows exactly how to touch you, what to touch you or how to touch you or the feelings that is in you, how he can emerge it out. So these are the two um, ways how the heart gets purified actually. The feelings gets purified and the feelings become very strong. 
And what happens when the feelings becomes more pure and more concentrated and more powerful is that over a period of time, and this is personally what I have experienced in my life and I could definitely vouch for it, is that there will come a time in your life where your vibrations will speak much louder than your voice and the other soul will pick up your vibration and will know exactly what you're trying to say. And looking at your eyes, they will also get the message because eyes are the windows for the soul and the vibration of the soul is also felt through the eyes. Right now, we are very much depending on a vocal communication but there will come a point of time where your vibration alone is, is loud enough. But in order to reach to that point is that I have to first clear the, the clutter or I would really say again, um, re-evaluate your perception, your understanding of right and wrong reevaluate because again we have highly been influenced by social conditioning and sometimes coming into the spiritual path um, we feel the destination is quite high and we can be sometimes intimidated thinking am i able to do this or, this could be hard for me or why am I not able to maintain this? And a lot of just X, Y, Z questions happening in my mind. I know this is the right thing to do, but I feel it's so hard. I feel the challenge is so hard. But then again, in order to have self-progress, it's not a matter of willpower, not at all. But it's a matter of courage. Courage to step out from your comfort zone or from your usual way of thinking and reacting. It takes a lot of courage. And when you do that, your heart will bless you actually. <laughs> you yourself will bless you so much for taking that courage to do because you are breaking the pattern of suffering of creating pain, of creating delusions. So these are just um, ways how I can purify my feelings. And feelings are coming from thoughts and thoughts can be com coming from our personality or here in Brahma Kumaris we call sanskaras. Really sanskaras are memories, past tracks that has been recorded in the soul in me. And I'm just operating based on those, which if those sanskaras are beautiful, meaningful, positive, my thoughts will be positive as well. But if those sanskaras are negative, then again, I'm reliving the pain. So forget about having a true heart. <laughs> Feelings are all messed up. Interactions are missed, uh, you know, it's messed up. So in order to have really a true heart is having the courage to step out from your box. Even though in the beginning you may be the odd ball, you will be the odd one because everyone else are still following the common sense of the world, right? Uh, people have created a lot of common sense, right? They said if uh, something happens, it's very normal to get stressed out. It's normal to get upset. And now let's ask the question, how common is common sense? Hmm. Not really common, I think. Country to country, culture to culture, common sense changes. So if it's a changing logic, then is it wise for me to stick to it? Or there is a deeper truth in me that I probably have not looked in. 
because truth is what is going to be very much permanent for you. But you need to get the courage to step out from your social conditioning. So is there anything anyone would like to share or ask? This is the Elizabeth. Yeah, thank you. Those are wonderful uh, insights and um, perspectives. I really like this idea of having the courage to change. And you said that the first step would be silence. And of course, recognizing my own heart and goodness, and then allowing goodness or God, <laughs> G-O-O-D or, or G-O-D into my heart. Um, now, can you share perhaps, um, Sister Vinu, a story or um, your own experience of of finding that courage in a situation and where you discovered how this works, you know, okay. to, um, can you? Okay. Me? So um, I actually, um, maybe it's a past and scara, um, again, you know, um, growing up in a social conditioning, um, you know, I, I come from a huge family. Um, my mom have 13 siblings. My mom is the eldest. I have 27 cousins. <laughs> so, um, and a lot of my cousins, you know, we grew up together. So we're all, a lot of us are almost similar age. Like I have four of us who are in my age, you know. So, you know, growing up, we sit for the same government exams. And it's very easy for parents to just compare how the other one is doing and how you are doing and just do that comparison and make you feel, well, if they can do, why can't you? And then you go to school, your teacher will do the comparison for you. So it's like, for me, maybe I have learned to feel um, low about myself or learn to um, hesitate um, mm -hmm. with who I am. And sometimes like when I'm given um, any challenge, like even public speaking would make me so nervous <laughs> because I wasn't sure if I would be able to speak up in front of big crowds. And um, just, you know, just sudden, suddenly something would happen. And then um, I'm, I'm just feeling but, you know, questioning whether I'm able to do it, whether I'm able to face it. So that that struggle um, had been there. And then I would go to, you know, I would have my communication with God and I would sit and I will just say, you know, I'm feeling this way, I'm feeling that way. You have to do it. I don't think I can do it. And, you know, X, Y, Z, I'll be just pouring out my feelings. And some or other, I have felt God's presence through someone's help would come, um, encouragement would come and then I see myself you know how I pass through those stages and also sometimes um, because of the lifestyle that I live um, you know like in my life I've never eaten out so food <laughs> again could be um, some it's, food is definitely a social element right when you go anywhere um, food is like the first thing when you get together um, and I don't eat out, but I still would go out with my friends and sometimes you'd be ridiculed and, you know, different, different um, ways and just all these experiences, I think, and it started questioning me, um, whether am I worthy enough? And I think coming here to US was a very big turning point for me. Um, it's been about 16 years now I live here in the Los Angeles Center. And coming here, one thing that I had to break was my comfort zone because I came, you know, all alone, um, depending on parents and, you know, that was there also. But then come here to a strange country. <laughs> I wouldn't say strange, but I would say it's very different. It's a very, very different culture. Um, and then you have to handle everything on your own, your finances, uh, work, and then you study and you earn money, you pay your bills, or you pay your um, housing, your hostel fee. So everything was uh, from, from scratch. But I learned the fact that, you know, coming here, um, I learned that I actually have these abilities. 
um, I learned that if I had stayed back in Malaysia thinking life would be tough here, I don't think I would have grown this much. Mm -hmm. For me in my life, that was the first step of courage. And in fact, when I came to US, um, I used, um, you know, my parents, because I didn't got my scholarship yet, it was taking time to process, but I had to fly to US uh, because the school was starting. So I had to, you know, uh, join in. Oh, so I cool. came, yeah, so I came with just one semester fees, <laughs> thinking that, okay, eventually um, the scholarship you will come through. Me. Huh? You trusted. <laughs> Um, I, I don't know if I trusted it, but definitely there was a lot of nervousness. Okay, what happens after that one semester? Because there's no money. So as soon as I came, I um, found a job in campus because when you're an international student, you're not allowed legally to work out of campus. And there are just odd jobs in campus. So I was working in the cafeteria and I remember my, my classes were like from 7 a.m. to 5 p.m. And then I would work from 5.30 to 10. And that's Monday through Friday every single day. And then I'll come home, shower, and then I'll start cooking like around 11. <laughs> then I will offer food to God because I don't eat without offering food to God. And I will always joke with him that I guess I'm the only person, the only soul was offering you the latest meal, <laughs> which is around 11, 11, 30. So I'll cook, I'll eat my dinner and I'll pack that for my next day lunch. So mm -hmm. I bring my lunch with me uh, wherever I would go. So that was another second step of courage that I took is that to trust. Um, and I remember that one month before um, you know, before the school was going to start, I got the letter from the school saying that I have to pay my fees. And if I don't, then, you know, then they would deport me. And so I was, I was thinking, okay, um, I said, okay, I don't have any, I don't have that much enough money to pay my fees. If this is it, if I have to go back, then, you know, fine. So I was already packing my bags thinking, okay, maybe, you know, I might end up going back. Mm -hmm. And just um, a week before the deadline, I got the email from the government, from Malaysian and government embassy that my scholarship passed through. So, uh, but the letter was in Malay, which is the local language in Malaysia. And I have to get it converted, like translated to English in order to submit to school. And that's going to take like, you have to email it or you have to mail the letter to right. New York, main embassies there. And that's gonna not that's not gonna take one week, that's gonna take more. So I said, okay, whatever it is, I'm just gonna go to the accounting office in my school. I'm just gonna show this is the letter. It says I got sanctioned, but it's not gonna come right away. But anyhow, I have the funds. <laughs> and sure enough, they allowed me. So just two days two days my deadline I was allowed to register for my classes and I joined so that was my first step of courage mm -hmm. and then of course there are so many so many um, areas where you know like near to failure like I feel okay this is the end finished um, but it, it happened like how I won a green card in the lottery that's how I stayed back never in my wildest dream I I imagined that I would win a green card in a lottery system and would stay back. I thought I would just eventually go back after my work. So, so these were just um, examples of how my, my life have taught me that even if I don't have answers and I don't have any reasons of, or, you know, um, what to stand on, you know, sometimes there's no pre-security what's going to happen you don't know what's going to happen mm -hmm. but it's okay just just face it anyway any anyway even if you're nervous just do it anyhow and you see it happening so do you think in your experience that by having a clean heart a pure heart a true heart that it helped you 
to be flexible because I'm hearing that you are just being ready one way or the other and light. I can hear it in your voice. And um, so do you think that that, that uh, true heart was able to help you in being uh, ready in that test, that challenge? Yeah. So um, true heart or I, I, um, true heart or we can say a heart that is very honest, a heart that is very, um, you can definitely, I like the word you use, flexible, um, makes, made me um, to face my situations, um, even though I was unsure how to respond or what to do, mm -hmm. but still I was there just, okay, standing face to face with it anyways. And then eventually I saw the way, the solution and how things worked out. And coming back to this, you know, talking about true heart, it has such deep power, actually. It has a lot of strength and a lot of power to sustain. Um, it sustained me, actually, throughout my challenge. Because when I say true heart, I was, um, I, I actually learned to encourage myself, to self-talk to myself. And to be absolutely honest and open with myself and say, okay, if I'm fearful, then let me tell to myself, yes, I'm not denying the fact that I'm fear. I am having this fear, but we know, I know you can still do it. We know you did it. We know you can still do it. I understand we know that you're, that you're nervous, but it's okay. It's okay. Um, here in Brahma Kumaris, we use the, we use the word Baba. Baba means God. So I always say, okay, um, Baba's hand is always on my head. I always visualize that Baba's with me. It doesn't matter what is in front of me because behind me is Baba. Behind me is Baba. Baba's hand is on me. We know you can do it. Go so ahead. Baba meaning the father, the divine father. Yes, the God. supreme soul, God. Baba is a very loving way of saying father. Yeah. Very sweet, very loving way. So that is that, that true feeling, um, the true connection when we have with ourselves and with God, you would feel that anything is possible, even though in the beginning you feel it is impossible. So having a relationship with God, I mean, that could be easy in some ways because you could trust that relationship. But how could I use a true heart in relationships to family or to colleagues, even the workplace? I mean, wouldn't having an honest and true heart keep make me vulnerable to, to uh, you know, maybe rejection or um, jealousy? Yes. You know, how, do, how does a true heart help me? in these kinds of situations and relationships. Okay, so I'll uh, share one example. <laughs> it happened because and, and rather than just saying words, I think uh, yeah, uh, I, I related personally with personal stories. Um, for me, um, you know, growing up, you know, with, with friends and with colleagues, um, they've all seen me as very naive. They all have considered me, you know, oh, she's just, too pure or too innocent or too naive. So sometimes they um, they are very good to me. You know, they speak sweetly. They especially they make sure that they don't curse anyone in front of me. And if by accident they do, I say, "Oh, sorry, you know, sorry, sorry. I shouldn't be saying these words in front of you." So they're just being like like very sweet in front of me. And I remember my best friend. Um, she, she has a complete different personality than me, but we were very close, very, very close. And she would tell me that, you know, they're, we know they're pretending in front of you. They're being fake. They're just being sweet and nice. You have no idea who they are behind you. Uh, they curse and they do this and they do that. They're just pretending to be good in front of you. So just um, hearing, you know, people like especially her and just so many souls saying that don't be fooled by their good appearance they could be just pretending 
So at a point of time in my life, I actually started doubting people. Uh, when they are good, are they really being good? Or are they just being good in front of me? I started, I was confused um, how, you know, how authentic they are. And I became a little reserved because I wasn't sure how to respond to people. I wasn't sure what's the real intention of people. But I think um, Baba taught me one thing is that if I am being good, if I am being positive, I will attract the same energy into my life. And in all of us, we do have the good side, we do have the negative side. But in whichever company we go to, that side within us will awaken. Mm -hmm. So I then, you know, over a period of time, I realized people are not pretending to be good to me. People are not faking to be good to me. Mm -hmm. But they are naturally, they felt they want to be good yes. when they are around me. I agree. And so bring out the goodness in others when you have faith in your own goodness. Yeah. I and so, you know, the question of whether I can trust people or not, actually, we don't really have to worry about that. We just fix our energy. That's it. You just work on your personality and you will definitely attract that energy even from the most negative person, mm -hmm. that side of them will be awakened when they are with you and you make them feel good. Okay. So don't worry <laughs> trying to analyze people. It's really not necessary. If I start analyzing people, I'll become very analytical and cunning. That is very powerful. I would like to underline that if I may. Your vision of others and well of course it stems from your own goodness of having a true heart but trusting the um, beauty in others the strength in others um i i feel it creates a bridge for them you know in your company so perhaps it's the trust i have in others that builds trust in relationships or the really trust like, in yeah, yeah. Well, or the trust in me that I would really see being very comfortable in your own skin, being comfortable and the trust in me, well then it will definitely show um, in how I am behaving, um, talking and understanding people. And when they feel I am, I'm seeing their good side, then they're motivated. Okay, I'm actually very good. I'm actually, I'm, I'm worthy to be respected because, you know, like example, Vino is respecting me. Vino is understanding me. And she makes me to feel that I'm actually good. Mm -hmm. So you bring out uh, that goodness in them. They probably have never realized. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it's contagious, actually. <laughs> Love is very contagious. Well, may it be the, the best thing to infiltrate the world. <laughs> That's one contagion we can live with. <laughs> we have a couple questions. Um, and this goes back to the difference between willpower and courage. Um, uh, so we have what, someone asking, what is the difference between willpower and courage? To change you were talking about changing yeah so willpower it means to have to do something consistently uh, to be able to maintain something consistently whether it's a habit whether it's a, a practice but to to motivate myself to even take the first step of creating that habit it takes courage and once I have that courage to take the first step of doing, and then the second, tip, second step again, I take another courage to do it. Then it feels, then, then after that, the willpower comes in, okay, 
I have experienced, I, I felt very good um, mm -hmm. thinking or doing this way. Okay, let me continue doing this. I enjoy having this feeling. Okay, let me continue a little more. So the first step comes the courage to even do it. <laughs> and then that experience from that is going to motivate you. Okay, then let me do it a little more. Let me do it a little more. Then your willpower will come in. Okay. Lovely. Yeah. And then a second question here. And if anyone has more questions, please put them in the chat or I'll open it up in a minute um, to um, ask on your mic. This question is, I'm confused between soul and brain. How does each function and how do we say uh, sanskaras reside with the soul and not the brain? So sanskaras, personality traits. Yes. So. Yeah. Okay. That's a very, I, I can understand. It's a very, it's a general, it's a very common confusion. <laughs> Uh, that happens uh, between the soul and the brain because, um, you know, where the soul resides here in the center. And there is a reason why the soul is not here or any part of the body because, because we've done this, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a neuroscientist by profession. So we used to do a lot of um, brain research. So if you go right here in the middle of your brain and if you slice your brain in half, and if you see that brain under microscope, you would see there are four main glands in your brain. Uh, glands are like major cells, components of cells that controls your, your body head to toe. And that are uh, the four glands are your hypothalamus, thalamus, pituitary and pineal glands. And these four glands, of course, they have their own functionalities but these four glands they all they are intercoiled but they meet at one particular intersection and this particular intersection is a hollow space because soul you cannot see in microscope it's just an energy but that is exactly where you are seated right here in the brain in the middle and you are controlling the whole body using these glands. And how the soul, which is just an energy, communicate with the brain, which is physical. And the communication is done. We call it in science, we call it electromagnetic field of energy. It is an electromagnetic energy that is coming from the soul to the brain and then the brain gets the signal and then it sends um, signals that we call electrical signals to all the other neurons in your brain. And then it releases hormones and then it goes through your hair, your neck and your body and you perform actions. But all of this happens less than a second. And because here, it's very easy for us to feel it's the brain that's operating, very mm -hmm. easy. But the soul and the brain is absolutely very closely connected. And the soul is highly depending on the brain to express through the body. And so when we say personalities or sanskaras characteristics, is it stored in the brain or is it stored in the soul? So these memories are stored in the soul and one evidence we can say from that is that, let's say in your past birth, you have encountered, maybe you drowned, example, just example, you drowned in water. And you experienced those moments, those last moments of trauma when you were trying to survive and eventually you drowned. And you bring those hurt, those trauma with you. And now you are in this present life in this present body you have no you have never had any disaster with water but yet the moment you see water something triggers in you some fear some nervousness now two different brains so if i've left those memories in that brain how can i answer for my fear now mm -hmm. right 
because the soul is same, different. The soul is same, and soul is bringing its memories with it, no matter which brain it enters, no matter which body it enters. But the memory track is there, and that is what we call sanskaras or personalities. So, how then am I able to change a sanskara, a personality um, that I've created in my past, and I had just I have no idea what actually happened, but I just have these habits in me which I want to let go. Mm -hmm. So in order to let go of a habit is you need to substitute the habit. So now in this present birth, create a habit that's going to be very fulfilling and allow you to grow spiritually and focus on that every day, day in, which is what I said the moment of courage comes in because you've already been in tune with a particular track within mm -hmm. and a particular way of operating. It takes a lot of courage to come out of it. But once you do it, then that's going to lead you to a second attempt. And then that's going to lead you to a third attempt. And then soon enough, you see you are very determined. This is how you want to think or respond. And then soon enough, that becomes your set another track that's recorded in you. And that's going to surpass whatever was the past recording. So we substitute habit. We substitute, we substitute, we substitute. Because to break a habit, it's quite... Um, um, it's quite tiring. Have you ever realized you try to break something, but it grows much stronger in you? Mm -hmm. <laughs> because the moment I think I want, I need to let go of this, I need to break this, I'm adding enough atomic energy for it to survive longer in my track. Thoughts are atomic energy based on science. Thoughts are atomic energy, it's measurable. But this energy, when it gets multiplied, each time you think about it, then that multiplication, that energy is amplified within me and that habit stays much deeper within the soul. It's not easy to take out. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that answers. <laughs> oh my goodness, it, it answers so much for me on many levels. Well, why, why I appreciate that um, uh, so much uh, this to be new is because you actually brought in a neuroscientific scientific perspective, but with that warmth of who you are, and also with a spiritual understanding. Um, past lives, we carry that spiritual consciousness, we are that spiritual consciousness, and then we come into a new brain, a new body but we bring the memory with us. Um, so that is really interesting. I hope that really uh, answered your question and maybe brought more. I see it, another question here or a comment. Uh, parents and kids have almost similar sense scars in is most common, yet they are separate souls. How do we explain that phenomenon? Okay, yeah. go for it. <laughs> It's, uh, it's not uh, surprising. It's not surprising at all to see um, similarities um, in the attitude between a parent and the child, because um, what this implies or explains is that these two souls have played very close connections in many births. These two souls um, have existed in many births um, together in different roles maybe. Maybe it could be an employer, employee, um, could be a grandparent and a grandchild, but whichever is the um, relationship that they have had in many births before, but there has been that synchronization, you know, um, that has been built between these two souls. And then now, um, you know, we, we oftentimes we use karmic account. Um, karmic account is not really a bad thing. Really karma means that there is an exchange of energy um, that has happened between two souls. That energy can be through your thoughts, words, and actions. If the exchange of energy has been positive, then the soul has experienced happiness. We call it good karma. 
If the experience of energy had been negative, then the soul experienced sorrow, which we call bad karma or negative karma. But either way, there has been some account, um, some sharing has happened. Yes. And now coming to this birth, um, because you probably have, you know, like right now you said, very similar attitude. If the similar attitude is in a good way, means you have actually um, created good karmic uh, relationship with each other in the past. But if the attitude is in a negative way, um, uncomfortable way, also you're reaping something that you've created from the past. But very important is, um, it is for us never to see karma as a punishment or I'm reaping what I'm receiving, but it is very healthy to see karma as a test paper. Mm -hmm. Because if I see karma as a punishment or I feels like I have uh, no control, that means I, I, it's just my fate. I am just experiencing what I'm fated for. Mm -hmm. uh, it makes me feel like I'm a victim. But at every given moment, even if it's a karmic account, I still have a choice. This time, this moment, this birth, I have a choice. How I am going to respond now is just like a test paper. You fail your test paper once, you fail your test once, you're given a second chance. And the second time you study extra hard, and then you do it better the second time is the same. So karma is really a test. It's the second um, opportunity that I'm getting with this soul to make it right this time. Thank you, that, yeah. that makes it very clear. Also, I couldn't help but remember, um, I had uh, twin cousins. I don't know if in your cousins you had a set of twins. And there, we used to uh, amuse ourselves because there was, they were so different. Uh, one was so sweet and you felt very comfortable to be in his company. And the other one, I wouldn't want to be in the same room by myself. I was, I was afraid he might hit me, you know, and this is as children. Um, so I, I, really had this impression from a young age of how different souls are. And I think from, you said you had 23 cousins that you lived with or were, you know, playing with as a child and how each one was so different. And I'm the oldest of seven children. And what I think started me on a spiritual journey was this question of why we are so different. But again, just as this question came up, you will see similar family traits for sure. Um, and I, I totally agree that um, we've had many lifetimes together, at least with some of these relationships, some for the good <laughs> and maybe some uh, karmic accounts are intense. Um, but I'd like to, uh, oh, here we do have another question. Um, can you explain why do the children suffer due to now we're getting into karma questions. So why do children suffer due to the bad actions of parents? Why is that? That's a class um, that we had last Thursday in, in LA Zoom. It's called Karma and Parenting. Okay. It's uploaded uh, in the Los Angeles um, YouTube channel if you would like to hear. So uh, let's talk about parents first they have their own social upbringing. Um, they have their own sets of conditioning that they have received from their parents, from their um, childhood and school, you know, all of this. And then whatever they learned from their parents, they sort of apply it to their children, to the children that they have given birth to. And so now the child is a new soul coming into my life and I'm being a parent for that child. Now, that child is not really, really a new soul per se. That child has brought its own um, sanskaras from his past. And now that that soul has become a child for me in this birth, 
And so I do have responsibilities toward the soul. How, what is it I would like to teach? What are the guidelines I would like to give and how I would like to uh, bring them up? Now, sometimes um, that love can turn into a possessiveness or can turn into an attachment in sense that I will start um, dominating that child's um, behavior or choices. I start making choices for them. Why? Because I tell them because I know better, right? So I start taking decisions for them. Why? It is a very, very subtle um, uh, characteristic that I would have learned from my parents. And then I feel what well, this is love. I have to protect. I have to mold them um, in the way that I know what is best. And so the moment we go into this aspect of trying to take full control of the child's life, right? Um, we disregard the fact that they already came, that they already um, uh, came with their own uh, set of sanskaras, personalities. Every time we enter a new birth, only 20% of our sanskaras are coming from our present parents. 80% are what we've brought with us, mm -hmm. right? And so to some extent, whatever I'm teaching my child, um, the child is getting it. Now in, in, in aspect like, you know, from the question you asked was bad actions of parents, okay? Now bad actions can sometimes make the family dysfunctional. We, we call it dysfunctional family means um, where it may be, uh, it's a single parent, maybe the other parent is, missing or left the body or just maybe could be separated because of divorce or, you know, X, Y, Z reason. Could be a single parent or could be a form of um, abuse that is happening, could be a mental abuse, could be a physical abuse. Mm -hmm. And so when parents, um, you know, based on their uh, experiences, past experiences or understandings, when they impose that on the child, then whatever this new soul, this child is seeing me, watching me, listening to me, is picking up. So then when this child grows up to an adult, they are probably going to repeat the same thing. And if that child repeats the same pattern that they picked up from me, a portion of that karmika khan goes to me as a parent also. Because I initiated, I planted that seed in them. I may not be responsible for everything that they do because remember I said only 20% of what I taught them, what they pick up, the rest 80 they brought with them. But what all seed I planted in them, I will have to be responsible. So what all they learn from me when they grow up, they do the same. And if they hurt another soul, part of that karmika khan I have to bear too. Not fully, but I also have some interest to pay. Mm -hmm. Makes total sense. So that's why it is a very, um, the first and foremost thing we say, child is not an object that I have to, you know, mold. and But I have to accept that this is a different soul. I do have a responsibility to guide, but more so than that, I have to respect their freedom. I can be a friend, I can guide them, I can share them my life experiences, but I cannot force them to take a decision, but I can, I can help them. Uh, what do they feel? What do they want? And then if despite after sharing, if they still take a decision, on their own, at that time, I just have to send them good wishes. Then I say, okay, um, if you ever need me, I'm here. I will be a support for you. So not just cut off in the emotional relationship with them just because they didn't hear or mm -hmm. listen to me. Mm -hmm. So give that freedom. And then what happened is if, like, let's say, you know, in our life, we probably have made a lot of mistakes too. Um, not 
following you know sometimes our parents sometimes we make our own decisions and we um, have experienced the result of it but now as we look back and say i can't say i regret doing it but i did that and that's how i i learned this right so mm -hmm. if it is in that child's journey for them to go through that so they can come out a better person i cannot stop that journey but i can give good wishes so that the journey that they're going through they don't suffer too much Mm -hmm. you know they more learning for them so this is really how karma and parenting also <laughs> plays a role that is beautifully um said uh sister vinu um because you bring you brought it full circle right back to trust you you we kind of went off into karma and parenting which is what it's all about relationships but then you brought it right back home to the true heart and building trusting relationships even whatever givens that are there or challenges that are there um, so thank you very much um, i'd like to open it up for more questions you could uh, turn on your mic if you'd like if someone has a question or type it in the chat um, so we have uh, Bob is asking, is it possible that um, once the soul it has passed on by the parent to the child? Pounds. Okay, wait. I, I, yeah, pa I, it's pounds. Wait, is it possible that what the? Okay, Bob, please clarify. Maybe a <laughs> portion. <laughs> okay. Is it possible okay. that a portion of the soul is passed on by the parent to the child at birth? So essentially, soul is identical as that of the parent. So you have genes in the body. Is it possible to pass on? Well, take it away, Vinu. Can the soul be divided? Never. It, can't pass on traits. Energy, um, again, I'll use thermophysics law, thermodynamics law. Energy can never be divided. Energy can never be separated or destroyed, but energy can be transferred. And how does that apply to the soul? Soul is also an energy, meaning that I can be transferred from one body to another body, you know, using another brain, but it cannot be a chunk of me is left behind. I am a soul as a whole. The energy is as a whole. So I move from one body to another body. But like I said, why do we do see some similarities with each other is because when we have played, um, you know, uh, in, 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 um, in neuroscience, we have this uh, term called energy synchronization. Um, in sense that people, I'm just giving you a very simple example, people who have lived very long with each other, who are very much in tune with each other's thinking and pattern and energy, sometimes even their hunger, they get hungry at the same time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it is. It is true. It's actually, it's a phenomena that's called uh, energy synchronization. And so if I have played with a particular soul many times, many births, I've already got in tune with that energy, with that pattern. Now, if even if I have moved on, both of us have moved on to another setting in this birth, another mm -hmm. roles we are playing, but soul is still the same, energy is still the same. We still pick up each other's pattern very quickly. Yeah. But it's never a portion of me goes in you or a portion of you goes in me. We certainly can be colored by um, the company we keep. Um, I mean, it's an honest observation, Bob. It totally makes sense in ways. Um, but I, I'm, I'm wondering in my mind if we're really answering the real question that you might have. Um, you know where do where does my karma end and their karma begin? Perhaps might be a, a question. 
um, but I, it, I feel that it comes from a very caring place. So thank you so much for asking that. It's a really good question. Um, anyone else have a question? You'd you, you're most welcome to uh, unmute your mic and. Can I ask uh, a question? Yes, Tim. Yeah. Um, actually, I had an earlier question, but then since you're talking about it, I want to ask this short question first. Um, uh, so is energy, uh, but are all energy so? Wait, um, you cut off. What was that? Are all so is energy, uh -huh. and but what about uh, all the energy? They are so, or are there energies that are not so? Okay. So um, energy, soul is okay. So the subset is the energy. I mean, the main, the main uh, field of energy and soul is a subset. We, in, in physics, we, we learn gravity energy. We learn kinetic energy. We learn um, just different energies, um, solar energy. So there are different types of energy which are matter. Uh, and these energies um, are, you know, uh, they also do influences. But soul is also a form of energy. And, and also um, another word we can use so we are not really confused is life force. Um, soul is a life force um, where the body operates. And why, why the soul is a different form of energy than the rest. So example, even if there is sun in your place, but if the soul is not in the body, the body is dead. Even if there is solar energy, even if there is kinetic energy, even if there is gravitational energy, but if the soul is not in the body, body ceases to function. So that is the supremacy that the soul has. The energy of soul surpasses all the other forms of energy. And why we are using, um, we are giving the example, the soul is also an energy because um, in terms of vibrations, um, we learn that um, energy flows from a higher point to a lower point that is fixed. That is the law for energy. It, it, it doesn't flow from high, low to high, but always from a higher point to a lower point. Now, how does that apply to that soul? How does that concept of energy applies to the soul is in terms of vibration, in terms of frequency. If I am creating positive thoughts, I am generating positive vibration. You know, like I said, thoughts are atomic energy. I'm generating higher energy frequency. When I am generating on a higher scale, people, whoever, if they are very, however ill or negative they are, they are vibrating at a lower scale. I am vibrating on a higher scale my energy can eventually influence them. This is how energy flows from a higher point to a lower point. So we are seeing how physics law applies even to the soul, but the soul is on an upper hand compared to all the other forms of energy that we see um, exist here. And if you really see solar energy, all the other energy, it only exists on earth. Mm -hmm. It only exists within the earth. It doesn't exist on space. But the soul can exist even when it's not on earth. Right? Mm -hmm. So this is how superior the soul is. Thank you. Thank you. I let other people ask questions first. If not, I do have another question. I let other people ask questions. Okay. Yes, it is a spiritual energy. <laughs> Would anyone else have a question? Okay, Tim, I think you could ask your question if you like. Yeah, um, my early question has to do with 
uh, boundaries. You're talking about if you have a good heart and you don't need to worry about other people, uh, even people who feel ill with you, you might be able to transform the energy. Not necessarily, of course. Um, so in your own situations, you have already practiced in pure heart for so long. Do you think setting boundary is important? Um, the reason I ask is because I, I, I don't like to set boundaries is because I already have so much opinion about people anyway. If I want to set boundaries, then that would be terrible. Uh, so in your situations, uh, do you, is it important? Does it, is it important to you? Um, if, if it is, then what is really setting boundaries? What is like, I never kind of understand it. Okay. So um, setting boundaries means, um, so example for me, um, there are some souls that I know could be very, very highly <laughs> negative, who would love to always complain, who love to gossip, you know, these are very common behaviors in, in a lot of people. Uh, we can't blame somebody for being that. It's very, very common. But then for me, I'm questioning myself. Do I want to have this energy um, more frequently in my life? And since that, uh, when you say boundaries, um, I'm not isolating myself from them or I'm not avoiding them. But I feel there are certain times, again, um, when I feel I am sort of you know, vibrating on a low, low field, that I feel that um, right now today, I'm not up to myself. So I want to give myself a break. I, I want to, you know, be more focused within me. I want to, you know, sort of recharge myself. So at that time, I give priority to me, um, rather than you know, dealing with certain souls. It's not that I don't deal with them, but I will deal with them later. But right now, I want to give focus to me. And when I feel, yes, I, I feel that I feel good and I feel I'm charged, okay, now let me deal with them. So it is about, again, you, you check. You check how you are feeling. You check what is happening within you. And you feel, what is it you need to do right now? Because moment to moment, sometimes our mood changes, our feelings changes. Sometimes we feel low, sometimes we feel very good. So moment to moment, you check what is necessary right now. And then accordingly, um, you, you take the action. Some days I feel very good. I feel very positive. So then I will reach out to those souls who um, wanted to speak. Or sometimes if I'm not reaching out to them over the phone, uh, then I reach out to them in my mind. Um, I bring them in front of me and I bring them in front of God, and just channeling that, that positive vibration, the positive energy to them so that whatever that they are experiencing, they overcome that and they don't lose hope or they experience peace. So just in from a remote, just, you know, channeling the energy to them. But if I'm weak at that time, what energy am I channeling to them? Mm -hmm. If I'm weak at that time, even little words that they say would affect me. So really be your own parent first and see what you are feeling. And then accordingly, you see, okay, now, do you feel, uh, do I feel right now it's time for me to reach out to them? Or let me wait, let me just get to myself as, you know, re recharge, and then I will get to them. So it's not isolation, but it is pausing and then acting, pausing and then acting. I see. So it's not about you worry about you will be taking advantage of. It's more about if I notice that I myself is a little bit down with negative energy. Um, so that's more, that is the boundary that we're talking about. Yes. Right. Take care of the emotional right. health first. Yeah. Right. And even if, if you do feel a big negative energy from the other side, but yet if you are able to handle it, uh, so you just deal with it accordingly. So it's not so much about boundary, not yeah. having people hurt you. In fact, it's a boundary that we make sure ourselves have enough power over them. Yeah, because um, every soul that would come in your life, um, 
they're coming for some answers. They're coming for some guidance. And um, if you are able to channel them in the right way, if you're able to, um, with through your vibration, if you're able to uplift that soul, it's a big blessing. But for that, you see your capacity. Am I able to do it now? You don't force yourself. Um, also respect your being, respect what you are feeling at the moment, and then act accordingly. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Om Shanti, I would like to ask a question. When the body dies, what happens to the soul? Classic question. <laughs> the body dies, what happened to the soul? So, it depends on how close the soul or how attached the soul is with the present family. If they are too attached, too emotionally entangled with the close family members, then what happened is for a few days, um, that soul in its subtle form, in its just vibrational, we call it subtle body or just body of vibrations, it is still around the close family. It is watching, it is listening, it is feeling, but it cannot express. Like for us, we are in this body. How we express our pain is through crying or through you know, venting out or how are we expressing our happiness is through smiling. So we need a body to express. Without a body, we can only experience, but we cannot share out. And so this soul, the, the soul that has just departed, it is watching and feeling everything that the family is going through. And if the family is mourning and very desperate and very upset, then all this pain that soul is feeling and the soul is, is suffering from that pain. Then eventually the soul, um, it depends again how much the soul is attached if the soul is very attached, then it's very hard for the soul to move on. But if the present family is able to let go, and you know that's why certain rituals in some culture, they do certain rituals, certain prayers for departed soul. Here in Brahma Kumaris, we do special meditation for them, just sending them that peace. And you know, just it's like a soul to soul communication that's happening. It's like I'm telling to that soul, um, I've learned a lot from you. You um, have you have you know um, taught me a lot in this birth. You have been such a beautiful soul in this birth. I've had a lot of memories with you, but I also know now it is time for you to move on. And there is another family that is anxiously waiting to welcome you, and you are definitely going to be a blessing for them. And so I let you go with a lot of peace, with a lot of love. I let you go to your next journey, and I know that you will be an angel for them. So that's like in meditation. I'm sending. I'm sending that. Um, that I'm wishing them to have a a beautiful transition to the next birth. And the more and more I do that, the soul will also feel. The soul will feel that I am ready to let them go. And when I'm ready to let them go, then the soul can go on to the next birth, right? And then the soul will enter the womb, will enter um, the mother's womb. And now this womb, for the soul, this is a stranger because it's a, uh, it's a it's a new set of family it's a new background it's a new atmosphere um, the soul is still hasn't adapted to this new environment so even though the soul is physically in another womb but the soul's consciousness is still very much um, attached to this past family that the soul left behind um, because the soul hasn't got accustomed you know, familiarized with the new family yet. So even in the womb, the soul is still yeah. experiencing your vibrations. Mm. Whatever you are sending, whatever vibrations you are creating, say in another country, but the soul is in another country, born in another country, still the soul is experiencing your vibration in the womb. And then eventually now the soul, um, you know, let's say it, it takes birth, you know, as a baby. And then the soul is getting to know its new set of parents, listening to their voice, their smile, their energy, energy of the 
surroundings, the soul is now getting used to getting to know these energies. That's why if you see sometimes um, babies, you know, in their sleep, either they cry or they, they, they laugh in their sleep. Why? Because um, the soul cries or love based on what type of vibrations the past family is sending. If they are sending you know, beautiful energy, energy, energy of love or peace, energy of, um, what do you call that? I'm able to come into phase, come into terms with the departure of you. Um, I, as a soul, you know, the new soul is going to feel, okay, happy, peaceful, at rest. But if the family is suffering and still mourning, then the soul is going to experience pain. So the soul then cries. And then once the soul started, uh, starts to grow up and getting to know the family, what happened is these new memories then will take over um, within the soul. The old memories are not deleted, but it sort of it goes beneath and the new memories take over the surface. So then the soul is now, uh, it starts to forget the old family, where it came from. X, Y, Z, you know, what it did. So it's getting to know the new family. But off and on, um, have you probably, you probably could have experienced it in your life also, where sometimes you are just happy and you just don't know the reason why. Or you're suddenly, um, you become so sad and you still don't know the reason why. Because it's probably not coming from you, but you're picking up energy from someone else. Right. So, so many factors are underlying in this, but just to make it brief, this is what it is. Yeah. Thank you. Yes, thank you. And also, too, it kind of comes back to something you said about having a clean heart, a pure heart. That energy can travel miles, you know, it can travel to wherever you're pure feelings can reach. So yeah. um, we, I think we might have time for, okay, now some questions are coming. Um, exactly when does the soul enter the womb of the mother? Okay, now we're getting into technical. Uh, is it when the heart is developed and it gives the first beat? Uh, okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. okay, that's a scientific question. Okay, I'll give you a scientific answer. <laughs> <laughs> so before the soul forms the baby, there are a few stages. In the beginning, it's called zygote, which this, the body looks like a lizard, actually. Literally, the body looks like a lizard. And if you see some pictures, you can Google. It's called zygote. And then after that, when, it starts, when the body starts developing, it goes to the stage of embryo, you know, months, right? And then after a few more months, then the soul goes into this, I mean, the body, the body goes into the stage of fetus. And then finally, it um, is born as a baby. So these are the stages of formation of the muscles, the heartbeats, the organs and the body. So at which stage does the soul enter? Is it when the body is in the form of zygote or uh, embryo or fetus? So the soul really it enters the womb when the mother when the pregnancy is between four to fifth month that means the transition between a zygote to an embryo and why the soul doesn't enter in the beginning because see um, example I'm just going to give a very, very simple example if you are going to move to a different house the house has to be at least pre-built it needs to have some structure you cannot just go and live on an empty land so a zygote is formed first in the body based on all this genetics but when the soul enters the body that is when the features of the body begins to form. And the features of the body is highly influenced by the sanskaras, the personality that the soul brings. And so that is when, that's why if you see abortion, right? Um, they will say if you are, you know, one month, two month, three month, and at least even the fourth month, it is still okay. But 
if you go beyond fourth month, abortion becomes dangerous even for the mother. Right? So that is when, when the soul enters the body, the body's feature begin to take place. Right? So that's just, again. Yeah, I, I think we're going to have to wrap up. Yes. Uh, um, okay, just lastly, if this is easy to answer, what is consciousness? Uh, is consciousness simply soul energy or a different type of energy? Or is it just energy? Okay, so consciousness, um, basically another word for soul is consciousness. Um, you know, it's soul is made of mind, intellect, and scars. This whole thing is called, um, we can say consciousness. So sometimes, you know, we use the word soul consciousness. Sometimes we use the word body consciousness. So what does that mean? Soul consciousness is when I am living based on my truth, based on my original um, sanskara. And like how I'm referring to the body, body, you have your genetic mapping, you have your chromosomes and your genetic mapping from parents, DNA, which is completely uh, unique to you. In the same way, DNA for the soul is are the virtues and powers. That's the mapping of the soul itself. So when I say soul consciousness, that means I am living based on my truth, based on my virtues, my original recording um, of the soul. And body consciousness are I'm living based on the adopted personalities that I have created along my birth. Uh, which again, coming back to social conditioning, whatever that I have learned to adapt, to mold um, throughout my lifetime with different souls, that is called an adopted personality, um, an adopted consciousness. So either I could be operating on a soul conscious, my original sanskara, or I could be operating based on my adopted sanskara, adopted personality. But really the consciousness as a wrap is the whole is just the makeup of the soul it's the soul yeah thank you thank you very much and for going over time and for all of you to stay with us and and um if we could close with a, a moment of silence and perhaps guide us with a few words to close thank you so much um we will meet again next Tuesday for a talk uh, with uh, Brother Harsha from San Francisco Center. And this Friday evening, 6 6.30 uh, p.m. this Friday, we will have harp meditation, which is music and meditation. Beautiful if you love live music and commentary. It's a lovely experience from 6.30 to uh, 8 o'clock on Friday at San Francisco Center. So thank you again, Om Shanti. So we can, we can do a meditation and um, maybe what we can do is um, I'll put up the light again and I'll lead you into a meditation. And what we can do is that the experience that you um, begin to you know, have, that you have in the meditation, um, let's maintain that experience and how we will quietly end this session. We will quietly end this Zoom. Nobody needs to speak. Nobody needs to share anything. You can be muted. And just quietly, we will end this session so that you could bring the, the experience that you have from the meditation, bring it with you even to your bed, right? Because when we start talking, the experience gets diluted. So let us have that, let us you know, bring that experience with this um, even after this class ends. Sounds good to everyone? Yes. Yes. yes thank thank you. you so much. Yeah. So I am going to put the light again on the screen. And then we will quietly end the session.
So let us sit back. And let me check. What is it that I personally learned from today's sharing? What is it that I would like to practice for my own spiritual growth from today's class? And do I have that courage to practice what I learned today? Can I tell myself that from today onwards, I am promising myself that this is what I would like to practice. And let me remember that this beautiful thought I am creating right now, two souls, are listening to this thought. One, I myself. And two, the Supreme Soul. And because I have decided this is what I'm going to do, then even the Supreme Soul is bound to help me, is bound to support me. This is how special and valuable I am to God and to myself. I am special, I am loved, and I am very safe. God is there to guide me through, to bring me answers. So I'm never alone. I am safe. I am protected. And let me always remember this. Om Shanti.